Indiana News Desk is made possible in part by Smithville Fiber Internet, Streaming TV, Home Security and Automation in Southern Indiana. More information at smithville.com. Maller Grodner Attorneys, providing legal services to clients and the community. Understanding, expertise, results. Bloomington and Indianapolis. LawMG.com. IU Alumni Association, connecting IU's network of alumni and sharing the Indiana spirit through scholarships, advocacy, and volunteerism. Alumni.iu.edu. IU Center for Rural Engagement, extending IU Bloomington resources to improve Hoosier lives in partnership with communities and organizations. Rural.indiana.edu. And by WTIU members. Thank you. Coming up on Indiana News Desk. Needle exchange programs face expiration next year after the state Senate rejected a measure to extend them indefinitely. People will still continue to use just because there aren't clean syringes available. They will go back to using um, and sharing dirty syringes. Um, and so we're going to see disease spread again. Now state lawmakers say they may extend the program, but only by a year. A Trump administration change of a decades-old law could mean curtains for some small Indiana theaters. It would mean that the studios can dictate how many movies and how often we show a movie, as well as even the pricing of the movie. Those stories, plus the latest news headlines from across the state, right now on Indiana News Desk. Welcome to Indiana News Desk, I'm Joe Wren. Indiana House leaders said yesterday they'll try to extend needle exchange programs for one year after the state Senate failed to pass a bill that would have removed the sunset date for the programs. Reporter Mitch Legan is with us now. He traveled down to Scott County where contaminated needles led to an HIV outbreak in 2015. Yeah, Joe, the CDC says Indiana has 10 counties that are vulnerable to an HIV outbreak due to injection drug use, while nine counties run syringe service programs. So health officials down there are really hoping lawmakers see the value in these programs. Michelle Matern has spent the last three and a half years as Scott County's health administrator working to prevent another HIV outbreak like the one five years ago. About 95% of the cases were also co-infected with hepatitis C. Um, and so all those cases back then were linked to injection drug use, sharing um, syringes with each other. The epicenter of the outbreak was Austin where the number of positive cases made its HIV infection rate comparable to sub-Saharan Africa. As the crisis in Scott County spiraled out of control, then Indiana Governor Mike Pence signed an executive order allowing the county to operate a needle exchange program. I will tell you that I do not support needle exchange as anti-drug policy, but this is a public health emergency. And I'm evaluating uh, all of uh, all of the issues and all of the tools that may be available to local health officials in light of a, a public health emergency. Um, you know, we're expected to have around 25 new HIV cases every year just based on our population size and the number of positive um, cases that live in our county. And we, the most we've seen in the last three years is 12 cases. Um, last year, I believe we had seven. Um, so every year we're trending downward. Matern credits the county's needle exchange for the drop in cases. Since Scott County started its exchange, eight other counties have followed suit, but their existence is now in jeopardy. The bill that allowed counties to start exchanges expires next summer, and if lawmakers don't update the language, the programs could go away. It was intended to be an exchange. It, did, it became a giveaway program in which hundreds of syringes were being given away at, at any given time, at any given location, at multiple locations. Grooms voted against the bill that would have extended the expiration of the exchanges. Clark County felt the effects of the HIV outbreak. Scott County residents came here in droves for treatment. Eric Yazel was an emergency room doctor at the time. In 2015, if you came in and told me that, you know, I'm using heroin and I need some help, I'd hand you a paper that had a phone number on it for a place that had a couple month wait, and that's literally all that we had to offer. Clark County also established a syringe service program, and Yazel says it's seen its overdose deaths fall by 50 percent. You use things repeatedly, it lets bacteria out in your bloodstream, and you get infections of your spine and heart valves and things like that. So. We have different needles here um, and we have other products that, you know, typically would be used over and over again when someone's using IV drugs. Back in Scott County, users can visit the health department's one-stop shop in Austin for clean syringes. 
but Matern says most importantly, it provides health care for those who need it. You know, we have peer recovery coaches that work in our certain service program that have, like I said, are in recovery themselves, and so it gives them a peer to talk to um, and walk them through that process whenever they are ready to um, be off substances and go into recovery. Um, so it's not just exchanging physical supplies, but it's an access point that um, is compassionate and caring. She says part of the difficulty surrounding needle exchanges is the stigma they carry as a sort of starter kit for drug users. And that whole world, word that's often used, and we still hear that even with, within the policy arena, is you're enabling the drug use. And I think over time I've come to uh, really see how it truly is a prevention and um, evidence-based public health measure. Research from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention shows needle exchanges help reduce the spread of infectious diseases like HIV and can help people overcome substance abuse. People will still continue to use just because there aren't clean syringes available. They will go back to using um, and sharing dirty syringes. Um, and so we're going to see disease spread again. It may not be the first year, it may not be the second year, but eventually we're going to see the increase of disease start again. And we're going to find out again that it's all through injection drug use. So back to square one. <laughs> and as we said, Indiana House leaders will try to extend the needle exchange programs by at least one year. But Matern and Yazel say educating the public and lawmakers about the usefulness of the exchanges is paramount to their success. All right, Mitch, thank you very much. Thank you, Joe. Well, it's Valentine's Day, so we're talking about love and relationships. About 40% of Americans have used online dating, but one of the problems is you're almost always completely unfamiliar with the person. So how can you find out if the person is who he or she says they are? Dating sites obviously don't do background checks, but there are some free tools you can use if you want to be an amateur sleuth. Our newsroom researcher, Kathy Knapp, joins us now. Kathy, now you have a lot of uh, background of doing research for news, but have you ever thought of kind of going outside that box and using this in love and relationships? Oh yes, <laughs> I've done that numerous times, probably more times than you would even guess. Can, can you give me an example? Yes, I'll check for some of my girlfriends. They'll meet Mr. Wonderful that sounds like he's too good to be true. <laughs> and I guess it could go either way. And I'll start digging around a little bit and they may have a past. But there are ways you can you can do some set some traps and run some names and find out some information about their background. So it gave me some research tips if you're looking for some more information on that love interest. Okay, I think you should always come with a full name. Um, you want a, at least a middle initial. Date of birth is imperative too. Um, where they were born and raised, that's big. And that's, if you have that much, you could probably turn something up. So what's some of the information that people can find online? Okay, you can go to my case. The city and the state, the county, they all offer information. My case is a wonderful place to start because it has criminal background and it has um, civil, and that will include uh, financial backgrounds. What, what other information's out there? Oh, you can check and see if someone owns property, if they own a business. Um, you can find marriage records, birth records, divorce records. It's a little hard to verify if someone has children. Other than that, it's out there and it's with um, your government website. Can you give us maybe a couple other websites that you go to on a normal basis for, for that? You already said one. Was it my, my case? My case, yes. Okay. That's huge because uh -huh. that is going to tell if someone maybe has multiple DUIs, mm -hmm. resisting arrests. Um, it just gives you a little bit of background information. So, so th this information, though, c c can be kind of sensitive. How do you deal with that? Well, if you find something out and you're seeing someone, I have a friend who got some not so good information and she just texted him and told him she was going to reconcile with her ex-husband and that she was reluctant to reconcile with him because he had a drinking problem. Mm. That's exactly what I found out about the guy she was dating is he had a drinking problem. And, and there's really no like not so website out there so you really have to kind of balance this information, right? Oh, you do. And you have to also know <laughs> that sometimes there is some bad information and also I want to caution you there are a lot of people with the same name. Thank you very much. Now for the latest on this week's top stories. 
An investigation by the Indiana State Board of Accountants says a quest to maximize profits at two virtual charter schools led to the inappropriately collection of more than 68 million tax dollars. The report found staff at Indiana Virtual School and Indiana Virtual Pathways Academy enrolled thousands of students who never took a course and some who didn't even know they were enrolled. Now, counting these extra students led the schools to collect tens of millions of dollars in state funding. The audit report said its findings had been given to federal and state authorities for possible criminal violations. Pete Buttigieg is facing a more intense spotlight on issues of race and policing as he tries to translate his strong showing in Iowa and New Hampshire into support in more diverse states. Buttigieg, who spent eight years as mayor of South Bend, has in recent days tripped up as he was grilled about his record, including the racial disparity in marijuana arrest in South Bend and decisions that led to him having no African-American leaders in his administration during a crucial stretch of his tenure. More than 2,400 sets of fetal remains that were found in the garage of a doctor who performed abortions in Indiana were buried this week. The remains were found on Dr. Ehrlich Kloffer's property in Illinois after his death in September. He performed abortions in South Bend, Gary, and Fort Wayne until his license was suspended in 2016. Attorney General Curtis Hill says the investigation into the remains and who else may have known about them is ongoing. Bloomington and Monroe County officials are finding out that equal representation for the Convention Center expansion project might not be as definable as they thought. City and county leaders are working on an interlocal agreement on how the different government bodies will work together in moving the process along, but it's been a slow, painful process. It, it does seem like we are, we are very, we are very far apart on this, and, and um, I'd like to hear uh, some ideas about where we can have legal start working together. The county and city also disagree on how much of the land the county should hand over to a yet to be named Capital Improvement Board. County and city legal staff have a month to hash out the agreement before the next meeting is tentatively scheduled for early next month. Well, during her State of Higher Education address, Commissioner Teresa Lubbers continued to draw the connection between higher ed and addressing the state's workforce needs. Lubber says higher education has to change with an increasingly diverse state to accomplish some lofty goals. She says, for one, people need more avenues to earn credentials. No longer can we assume that a singular credential is tied to lifetime success. The new economy will demand educational upgrades throughout life, and higher education must be more ag agile and relevant to meet this need. Lubber says the commission also aims to enhance equity in communities around the state and develop talent. She says the commission will highlight progress by keeping score on an annual report card. The Indiana NAACP says keeping local plants, keeping coal plants open longer would negatively affect the health of low income and minority communities in the state. The group has asked lawmakers not to approve a bill that could delay coal plant closures. The bill would require the state to review a plant closure, hold a public hearing, and issue a report on whether the closure is reasonable. NAACP representatives say low-income and minority groups that live near these coal plants are often neglected. Well, it looks unlikely the House will restore employment accommodations for pregnant workers that were stripped out in the Senate last week. That's despite, despite the support for the bill from Governor Eric Holcomb. Legislation this session would have ensured that employers reasonably accommodate their pregnant workers, things like seating or more frequent or longer breaks. But Senate Republicans eliminated those provisions, and House Speaker Brian Bosma appears unwilling to restore them. Former Monroe County Council member Shelley Yoder says she's throwing her hat in the ring to represent Bloomington and all of District 40 in the Indiana State Senate. Now that seat is currently held by Democrat Mark Stoops, who announced late last year that he would not be running in the 2020 election. Yoder says her experience working across the political aisle makes her an ideal candidate to get things done with the Republican majority in the Indiana State House. I have a unique skill set to be able to reach across the aisle, build relationships and collaborate. And that's what it's going to take to really get anything done 
in at the state level. Yoder, a Bloomington resident, ran for a seat in the U.S. House of Representatives twice, once in 2012 when she lost to Republican Todd Young and in 2016 when she was defeated by Republican Trey Hollingsworth. She will go up against state Democratic chair John Zodi in the primary on May 5th. Attorney General Curtis Hill's office is taking legal action against the Charlestown-based nonprofit Wildlife in Need. In the lawsuit, Hill's office asks the court to dissolve Wildlife in Need's assets and place its animals into court-approved animal sanctuaries. The suit cites a history of animal abuse and neglect at the facility. Hill also filed a motion for a preliminary injunction that would prohibit the operators of Wildlife in Need from removing animals from its premises during the pending the court's final order. The Lagodi Library moved into a new space last month that's three times the size of its old location. Darla Wagler says the library has been able to expand its services, including having a space to help residents find employment. They offer services uh, as far as um, helping you with your resumes, job searches, uploading those resumes, which a lot of the organizations require now. The library received a $1 million loan from the U.S. Department of, Agric of Agriculture to build the new location. The funding focuses on, on improving facilities in rural communities, and Lagodi is the first city to use it for a library. Coming up next on Indiana News Desk. Independent theaters have been able to keep costs down because of a decades-old law, a law some Trump administration officials want to repeal. Ahead, we look at what that could mean for some small-town theaters. Signs, signs everywhere, signs for our City Limits series. We look at all those street signs around town, how many are there, and how much does it cost to keep them up. These stories and more right here on Indiana News Desk. The WTIU WFIU news team connects Indiana to the world. We bring you the top news of the day on radio, TV, and online. We round up the stories that have people talking each week and dig deep into the issues that affect your community the most. The WTIU WFIU news team is where you are and telling your story. In a time of change, where can you find in-depth reporting and thoughtful analysis? Washington Week on PBS. Join moderator Robert Costa. When I was at the Capitol this week, I encountered the same... And a panel of award-winning journalists. You're seeing a divided nation and you're seeing... For insights and perspective. Tonight there was a key development in the You Senate won't find anywhere else. What a week. Washington Week. Welcome back to Indiana News Desk. Small and independent theaters are often one of the few forms of entertainment offered in small towns. But the Trump administration's desire to repeal a decades-old law could, be, could mean trouble for small-town cinemas. Adam Pinsker tells us why one iconic Indiana theater is worried about its survival. New Year's Eve 1928, Spencer's first movie theater, The Tivoli, opened. It's the longest running theater in Indiana at the time. Local sculptor Ernest Viquesny built the Tivoli and named it. Where did he get the name Tivoli? He said, this is Viquesny's own little idea. An idea that survived two fires and years of neglect before reopening in 2013. But some are worried it may not be able to survive a Trump administration policy that would overturn an early 1940s era law called the Paramount Decrees. <laughs> In 1938, the Department of Justice sued the eight major movie companies, claiming they had conspired to control the motion picture industry by determining what movies local theaters had to show and when. How do you make them go fast, laddie? See now, little the court ruled in the government's favor, forcing movie companies to sell off their theaters. The Department of Justice filed a motion last fall to terminate the Paramount decrees. Government attorneys say the decrees served their purpose and the movie industry has changed so much over the decades it's unlikely the remaining movie companies will resume their monopolies. Independent single-screen theaters like the Tivoli are some of the biggest opponents of reversing the Paramount decrees for the very reason they were instituted in the first place. It would mean that the studios can dictate 
how many movies and how often we show a movie, as well as even the pricing of the movie. Admission to the theater is $5 for adults. Concessions are relatively inexpensive. White says the combination of a volunteer and part-time staff help keep it that way. But if the movie producers charge her more to show films, the cost could be passed on to consumers. That's one of the draws of our theater is affordable pricing for families as well as um, just anybody that's looking to, to do something inexpensive. White is also worried her theater will be forced to show films on its lone screen that not everyone will want to see. If we wanted to show Star Wars, they would probably say, well, then you have to do these less desirable Disney films in order to get it. And that really breaks down what we're able to provide the public. The Tivoli offers more than just movies. It provides a stage for a local civic theater group, as well as space for schools to hold their productions. If we start not seeing people coming to Spencer for the theater, then they may also not come to the new restaurants that have opened up and could really hurt our county overall. Supporters of the Tivoli hope the government will reconsider or this could be the closing act on decades worth of memories. We have people that return and they tell us these wonderful memories and the Tivoli is deep in their hearts. And so we want to keep that strong and keep our community alive. For Indiana News Desk, I'm Adam Pinsker. Bloomington, like every city, spends a lot of taxpayer money on street signs. As part of our City Limits series, Matt Rasnick looks into where the sixty to $70,000 a year the city spends on signs ends up and which signs are stolen most frequently. Mike Stinson says there's a science when it comes to placing signs throughout Bloomington. Regulatory signs are your white and black signs which have a ordinance or a law that backs them. So and they're typically uh, engineering gets involved with the proper placement of those. The Bloomington Parking and Traffic Commissions also play a role in where new signs get placed within the city. The uh, Parking Commission and the Traffic Commission also play a part in if it's something that's, you know, somebody wanting another stop sign uh, at a location, uh, those particular type of requests need to go through uh, the Traffic Commission. There are slightly less than 15,000 signs that are overseen by the Bloomington Street Department, according to data from the city. The most common signs you will find are regulatory parking signs. There are more than 3,500 of these in the city. With all of those signs, local resident Dave Johnson wants to see more done to keep pedestrians safe in crosswalks. He points to the corner of Rogers and 4th Streets as a good working example. Because drivers have to be totally aware that a pedestrian is using the crosswalk, and I think those yellow flashing lights would be uh, very much helpful. The city has instituted a U-Report system where residents can report a number of issues they find around the city, including requesting additional signs. Through this system, residents can track their reports to see how they will be handled. Residents can also use the U-Report system to report signs missing, which is a problem the street department deals with often. Stop signs and street signs are among the most stolen. Probably my high street street name signs is the largest. I, I probably have to replace high street probably at least twice a year, sometimes three times. And that's every, that's every cross street on high street. Uh, that's a lot of signs. Aside from using the U-Report system, Stinson says residents can help by being patient and maintaining trees on their property. What the residents could do to help out the sign would be make sure that their trees are trimmed, make sure that the signs are visible. For Indiana News Desk, I'm Matt Rasnick. And according to the National Retail Federation, consumers this year will spend an average of almost $200 on Valentine's Day celebrations, much of that on flowers. Benta Boutier has this. Rick Hahn is the owner of Flowers and Interiors in Bloomington. He says if Valentine's Day falls on a weekend, people won't spend as much for flowers. If it falls, say, on a Saturday, you don't do as much business. Uh, if it's on Sunday, uh, you basically do very little because you're not really open. Uh, the best day for Valentine's Day actually is Wednesday. It's midweek. He's worked as a florist for nearly 50 years and says he's seen a lot of changes to the business. 
Many chain stores sell flower arrangements now, which makes a difference for local vendors. The floral shops have become more specialized. He says the average consumer is more educated and doesn't want to purchase flowers like carnations anymore. They want a higher end flower and, and you don't get that at a box store usually. I've got an iris uh, that I'm going to pick. Probably the most casual that you make this, the better it will look. Han says online ordering has changed the flower business. Now, many customers place orders through online mediums that get filled by local shops like Hans. The sending florist uh, takes 20% off the bat. Uh, FTD takes uh, $750 usually for their share. So basically, out of every $100, uh, we're getting $70. He says this doesn't include the cost of setting up and maintaining the website where he receives orders. For Indiana News Desk, I'm Ben Taboutier. And we're out of time. Have a great weekend. Indiana News Desk is made possible in part by Smithville, Fiber Internet, Streaming TV, Home Security and Automation in Southern Indiana. More information at smithville.com. Maller Grodner Attorneys, providing legal services to clients and the community. Understanding, expertise, results. Bloomington and Indianapolis. LawMG.com. IU Alumni Association, connecting IU's network of alumni and sharing the Indiana spirit through scholarships, advocacy, and volunteerism. Alumni.iu.edu. IU Center for Rural Engagement, extending IU Bloomington resources to improve Hoosier lives in partnership with communities and organizations. Rural.indiana.edu and by WTIU members. Thank you.